Hello, BookTube. Well, we come to it at last, the end of our uh, 2018 read-along of Homer's Iliad. Uh, our Homer along for the Iliad this year uh, ends now uh, with these final books of, uh, of Homer's epic, which start uh, with the death of Patroclus, the, the dear bosom companion of the Greek warrior Achilles, and the horrible fight over his body, and the, the news brought to Achilles that his friend, ha wearing his own armor, has died <clears throat> at the hands of Hector, the greatest of all the Trojan warriors. And uh, these last books are a sleigh ride. <laughs> they, they rock it along. They're not what you... Usually it's been my experience that first-time readers of the Iliad don't expect most of what they get in these books, and they certainly don't expect what, what comes as an ending. Uh, to th to that I would I would stress that the this is not meant to be an ending. This is if if you were able to find the group of professional performers who at one point or another were what we now call Homer, and were to present them with the book that we've been reading this month, they would find it odd. <laughs> not only that it isn't the whole story. Why why isn't it, this a collection of Iliads? Uh, but also, uh, they would find it odd that you would think that their audience for this particular story, The Wrath of Achilles, would expect it to end any other way than it does. It, it, to them, to their idea of this particular arc of the whole Trojan matter, there is a beginning, a middle, and an end, and it all makes perfect sense. Um, maybe not. Well, I mean, that'll be one of the things I'll want to ask you at the end of the video, is what you made of, of the whole of this as we conclude it. Uh, one way or another... Uh, Patroclus is dead, and as a direct result of that, Achilles returns to the fighting. And he only has one goal in mind. He's, he's perfectly happy to kill as many Trojans as he can, but he only has one goal in mind, and that's to kill Hector. And it's a goal that no one wants him to do. The Greeks, of course, wanted to do it, but no one close to him. The Greeks, we get the strong impression, don't like him. <laughs> but his mother, the sea goddess, loves him and tells him again that it's, it's been prophesied that he himself is not fated to outlive Hector by long. That's why she didn't want him to kill Hector in the first place, and she's extra worried now. But it's not he doesn't get a prophecy of his own doom just from his mother. He even gets it from a talking horse. <laughs> in these One of, one of a, a pair of enchanted, human, intelligent, vocal horses prophesies in these books that he will die, that, that his death is soon. But he doesn't really care. He's heedless. Achilles is heedless. He is heedless in almost all cases. Um, in fact, it's a big deal to get him to pay attention, which is part of the resonance of the end of these books and the end of this epic. But eventually, ranging like wildfire outside the, the walls of Troy, even fighting a river god, uh, eventually, his rampage, its single-mindedness, comes to the mind, comes to the attention of the Olympians, and and uh, Zeus, the king of the gods, releases them from all of their restrictions and just lets them go to fight in the battle one, on one side or another as they see fit. And that would be the CGI fest that would conclude a movie of the Iliad if anyone were ever <laughs> would ever make one. It would be, very temporarily, the focus of battle shifts entirely away from the human world, and it's just God against God. <laughs> uh, with some very amusing, very, very dramatic results. Those of you who, some of you, quite a few of you, actually have been telling me that all along your favorite parts of the Iliad have been the God parts. Well, you get the ultimate payoff <laughs> in these books. Uh, but it doesn't last long. The gods don't, don't seem to have much. First of all, unlike humans, there are only a few of them, and they're not evenly matched. So their fights amongst each other are not have no chance of lasting for 10 years in protracted siege. Uh, but on top of that, the, the, the dramatic sense of the poet wants to move the conflict back to humans, and does, and brings it to a point. Hector, outside the walls of Troy, facing Achilles. And Hector is there uh, largely because he thinks he has support. He thinks he has his brother beside him, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an illusion. It's a, it's a trick that the gods have played on his mind. And they don't uh, spare him the knowledge that it's a trick. Instead, they let him know 
one minute his brother is there, the next minute his brother is not, and in that minute, Hector knows he's doomed. And he does something that I hate. I, I As far as I'm concerned, Hector is the hero of this poem. And in that moment, when he sees that his that his teammate is missing, and that he'll be facing Achilles alone, he turns on his heel and runs. Runs and runs and runs around the base of the city of Troy, outside the, uh, the foot of its walls, with Achilles in hot pursuit. I think it's a betrayal of everything we've seen from this character in the rest of the book. And it doesn't get him anything. Achilles' speed, his ferocity, his non-human ability has been well-touted throughout the poem, even though we haven't seen much of it. And Achilles eventually catches up with him. And desperately, Hector proposes a bargain that whichever one of them wins in their coming single combat that person will guarantee the sanctity of the corpse of the loser. There won't be any dogfights, none, none of the to and fro that we've seen so many times in the course of the poem. And Achilles scornfully refuses. He doesn't care at all and immediately kills Hector. And then proves that Hector's foresight in asking for that bargain was extremely well-grounded because he digs an all through Hector's feet and drags his corpse around the walls of Troy utter desecration for the Trojan society, for Greek culture, for the gods themselves. It's an utter abuse. Uh, not just for the body, for a naked body to be fought over by people who want armor or spoils on, on, in the heat of battle, on the battlefield, but for a body to be willfully desecrated. Uh, Achilles does this, and then he drags the body back to the Greek camp. He's a little frustrated because the gods are preventing the body from scarring or decaying. They're at least doing that. Homer, Hector is still beautiful. Uh, but it doesn't matter. Achilles is sunk in on his in, in, in his own uh, obdurate pride and holds funeral games, elaborate funeral games for Patroclus, and the, the Greeks all, all take part. But there's a furor on Olympus the whole time because Hector is untended. And it's a furor matched in Troy by Hector's father, King Priam, who, in the final bit of the poem, travels alone. I mean, with a with one muleteer driver, but essentially alone, to the Greek camp. An astonishing gesture. In order to find Achilles alone and beg for his son's body back. And it works. <laughs> at last, at long last, at the end of this long poem, the wrath of Achilles is extinguished. Uh... And that is the end of the Iliad. That, as we're told, is the end of the story of Hector, the breaker of horses. Uh, and when it came time, this is a little bit of a personal digression, but when it came time, when I finally decided to write Troy War, my no I wrote a novel about the Trojan War. I wrote the Trojan War in the form of a novel, not just Homer, but Quintus Myrnius, the all the Homeric bits and pieces that come after the funeral of Hector. And when it came time for me to do that, I simply could not have Hector behave that way in the final moments. I wanted to read... I've, I've held off reading anything of, of, uh, of Troy War, but I want to read you uh, my version. <laughs> that, just, just for the record, and then we'll move on, because we've, we've got a little time left in this video. Uh, this is the crucial moment. Uh, fear came to Hector at last. The thought of killing Achilles was his fondest hope. The thought of dying in single combat at the hands of Achilles, though bleak, had honor. But this, to be simply dispatched like a gopher? He actually thought of running. No time now to get the gate open, no way to get to the river's banks. He thought of simply running away, in the opposite direction from Achilles' charge, around the walls of Troy. The thing that stopped him was shame. It galled him to think the future bards would sing that great Hector had run in blind panic under the eyes of his city. The Greeks would write the histories, the bards would sing it anyway, but he didn't know that. Achilles, a pact, he called out when Achilles stopped some dozen paces from him. The victor gives the vanquished body back to his people for honorable burial. Shut up, Achilles said, unlimbering a spear. You took my things. He launched a spear at Hector, who dodged enough to let it glance off his unbreakable armor, because he's wearing Achilles' old armor. Uh, Those are my things you've got on, Achilles said. He doesn't care at all about the man, Hector thought, remembering Patroclus. He threw his first spear, remembering what Achilles had not, to aim for the unprotected throat. Achilles dodged his strike in a blur of motion, snapped right back upright, and took up his second spear. 
Have to time this just right, Hector thought, but there was no dodging the speed of the thing. Hector pulled back sharply, heard the spear chucking into the dirt behind him, felt a sudden jolt of joy that he was alive, that somehow Achilles had missed. Then he noticed the blood pouring from his throat. Instinctively he put his hands up to it, felt the heat of his own blood escaping through his fingers. His sight swam for a moment, and when it cleared again, he was laying on the ground, and Achilles was standing over him. He could hear his mother screaming. He tried to draw breath to tell her to stop, but all he heard was a sucking, bubbling sound. You shouldn't have left. You should have left my things alone, Achilles said, ramming the spear down with both hands. Hector didn't feel it. He didn't feel anything except a great lifting wind. And then he was soaring up over the plain, seeing the Greek ships and the god-built walls of Troy receding below him faster and faster. And the higher he rose and the faster he went, the less of Hector there was, but only the honking of high-cruising geese and the wailing of the ionosphere and the silent chorusing of the stars. That's how I ended uh, 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 my version of Hector, the breaker of horses. Uh, but I... I uh, I want to know what you thought of Homer's version, <laughs> not mine. And I also want to know what you made of the end of this book. We are now done with the Iliad. We got all the way through it. And I hope, those of you who stuck through, I hope you saw that this is meant to be enjoyed. This thing is meant to be enjoyed. It's, you're meant to laugh at the antics of the gods. You're meant to love the human moments and be repulsed by the gore of combat. You're meant to feel the dust and the heat and the sunlight. And you're meant to smell the ocean. And you're meant to wonder at characters who you want to like, but who aren't always likable. And that that's the genius of Homer, is that he captured all of that thousands of years ago, <laughs> long before any of those things became what we now consider to be the staples of modern fiction. They all come from him. And I, I, I think that, of course. But I, I want to know what the rest of you think. What did you think of the ending of this epic, those of you who stuck along all the way to the end? Did it satisfy you? in any way. I know the first few times I read it, uh, it did not. I was expecting an ending, and there isn't an ending. There's an ending to one story. And the key to keep in mind is that Homer tells us that story right at the beginning. He announces at the very beginning, all those weeks ago when we read it, that his, his subject is the wrath of Achilles, not the Trojan War. He tells the arc of that wrath. The Trojan War was long established when he opens his story, and it's going on full tilt when he ends it. Uh, and I'm wondering if that bothered you, or if you got into the swing of things and liked it. Uh, so tell me everything. And also, uh, one thing that I forgot to mention, I've forgotten to mention it a few times now, is uh, feel free in the comments. We're, we'll discuss all this. And I love reading your comments. I'm not responding to many of them, because I'm, I'm mainly just listening. But I'd love to know what translation you're using. I'd especially love to know I mean, it's unlikely, but I'd especially love to know if there's a translation that is a so-called winner, if if there's one translation that most of you are using. <laughs> uh, this time around, I, I found myself, just for handiness sake, using the, the prose uh, translation from, from Penguin Classics. I didn't make a big deal. I read and reviewed uh, the... There was a new translation video that came out in verse from Paul Dry Books uh, just this month. And I, I read it and reviewed it. I'll leave a link down below. Uh, I didn't want to use that because uh, it's brand new and it's not in wide distribution. And also there were large things about it that I didn't particularly like. Uh, and I, I didn't want to make an issue out of translations anyway because then that makes an issue out of going and buying things or finding things. I, any translation will do. I want, to I want to stress that in all of these read-alongs. Uh, that that when we do read-alongs on this channel, I don't want you to, to be out of pocket at all. I want it to be something that you can go and find for free at Project Gutenberg or online, or that you can find for a pittance in a used bookshop, uh, or that you will find for certain at a library, and prose translations of Homer are very popular with students <laughs> who don't understand how to read verse at all, or think they don't. Uh, but one way or another... Uh, I'd love to know what translation you're using, and and all of your thoughts on what we're going on on what we've been reading this far. Uh, so we will reconvene in August. Homer along will reconvene in August for the Odyssey, uh, and for that read along, I will, I think I will be using mostly the Fagel's translation with a great introduction by Bernard Knox. Uh, but I might not, and you shouldn't care at all. <laughs> whatever whatever translation strikes your fancy, go to the library. If they have two or three or four translations, just sit down at a table and read the first few bits, just the first page, 
of each one of them and just pick the one that you like the most. <laughs> Believe me, there's something to recommend almost every translation of Homer. <laughs> something, some translations of Homer have very little to recommend them, but at least it tells you the story. And that's what we want to concern ourselves with, especially since for a lot of you this is the first time. Uh, so, and, and, the, and for those of you who, for whom it is the first time, I want to stress what I stressed in our Western Canon starter kit, which is that these things should not be intimidating. Yes, they're old. Yes, they're foundational. Yes, they're taught in schools. But they are meant to be read and enjoyed. <laughs> so, the minute you start talking about parsing translations and what's correct and what isn't and line lengths and dactylic hexameter, the minute you start talking about that, so that sort of stuff, which is interesting down the line, but the minute you start talking about it at the beginning, you start making people feel like they're not prepared. And if you've read any fiction at all, you are prepared to read Homer. <laughs> so, so let me know uh, what you thought of this whole thing. Uh, and, and as to the, the burning question, what we're going to do for July, I have, I have a thought. We haven't been able to come up with a book. And uh, I don't know why that is. Maybe I just need to pick one and see how many of you, or maybe put forward a few examples and see how many of you vote on what. But I haven't done that. And, uh, and it occurred to me that there is another read-along <laughs> that I've been invited to join. I'm never invited to join in read-alongs. Erica at Perks of Books invited me to join along in her read-along of Meg, <laughs> of the great giant shark novel Meg. And I love the book, and it's old enough and has had a healthy enough print run, so I expect that a lot of you could probably find it. But the key, the, the, the little bit, the escape clause that I'm using here, is that in this case, it's a read-along that I'm not hosting. My own rule, I think, for my own read-alongs will be that it will never be a book you have to go out and buy. It will always be something that you can find in the common domain. I like talking about those kinds of classics anyway. And uh, they also help to put my money where my mouth is when all, all through the Western canon I was saying, you can read these things. Well, why not help you? Why not read them with you? <laughs> uh, but, but if somebody else is hosting a read-along, <laughs> then maybe I can get away with joining in even though it's a book you have to buy. Although maybe your library would have a copy if they've lowered their acquisition standards far enough. <laughs> but one way or another, I think for July, unless you insist otherwise, for July, I think the read-along, my read-along will just be a weekly visit with Meg. Uh, unless you say otherwise. If you say that in addition to Erica's read-along of Meg, you'd also like a read-along on this channel, then I'll come up with something <laughs> and we'll do a read-along for July. We still have plenty of time uh, to decide because July starts on a Sunday, so we, we we have you know a whole many many days to figure it out. Uh, so I'm going to wrap this up for now. So in the comments field, not only let me know what you thought about these these last books of the Iliad and what you thought about the Iliad in general, but also uh, let me know what your thoughts are about the next read along. Do you want to do one that's special to this channel? Or should we all just do Erica's read-along of Meg for the summer? <laughs> uh, one way or another. I'll, uh, I'll wrap this up, and I'll see you soon. Thank you, BookTube.